All right, so we've kind of gone over all the foundations of MATLAB now. We've gone over variables, operations, built-in functions, so on, and we've gone all the way to loops. So now we're going to kind of be building off of that and going into numerical techniques. So just when you have data, uh, MATLAB is used a lot to deal with data because it can store data in matrices and such. So it makes it really good for a variety of things there. So when working with data, you can have a lot of different things you're trying to do. You could be trying to approximate values at points you don't have. For example, just trying to figure out, OK, if this is the uh, temps at some time, then if you want the temperature right here, like halfway between these two points, how would you figure that out? That's a numerical process. Maybe you want to differentiate the data. Maybe you want to integrate it. Uh, if you got like the position over time, you can differentiate for the velocity. If you have the acceleration, you can integrate to get the velocity, things like that. And you can find equations to fit the data as well. Uh, so the things we're going to be going into now are approximating values at points you don't have, as well as finding equations to fit to the data. And then we'll be going into sort of the calculus stuff, the differentiating and integrating later. OK, so first of all, if we want to find the point, like with this, uh, in between some set of points of data, we can use interpolation. So there's two things here. There's interpolation and extrapolation. And with interpolation, it's where you have data surrounding it. So basically, it's used to predict things in the intermediate of some data. So like with this, let's just say we are given the temperature at two times of the day. I'm giving it at 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock. This is the time the temp the temperatures let's just say they're this whatever 40 and 50 so you've got the temps at three and five and you want to guess what it would be at four well we could look at this and guess well it's probably somewhere in between there so if I look, it may be something like this would be a guess. Just me as a human trying to figure out what that temperature is. I'd guess it's like 45 degrees, right? Because if it's just going up in between here and here, somewhere in the middle, I guess 45. And the process of doing this more structured in academic sense is interpolation. And so instead of just guessing uh, with interpolation, you use curves to approximate in between points what that data will be. So for example, there's linear interpolation. And what linear interpolation does is you draw a line basically between the points. And then you use that linear relationship to approximate where uh, the temperature is going to be at any time. So you could say 3.1 and then use a line, the equation of this line here to approximate what that temperature would be. And so with the linear relationship assumed here, we can just say 4 is exactly halfway between the 40 and 50. And so it would be 45. So that's linear interpolation. Um, there are others where you can do curves. So like if you have a lot of data, you do use a curve to fit and interpolate using that curve and do it that way and just use the times and approximate in between points like that. So that's interpolation. When you have information and data on both sides of the point you're looking at. Extrapolation is when you have some data and you're trying to look either in the future or in the past, just forward and back of the points at which you have data. So if you wanted to look past this point to predict what it would be, or 
back behind this point. So you can use similar techniques, like you can use a line to extrapolate out to find, okay, at this point, it should be this value. This point, it should be this value. And like with this, you can use curves, you can do splines and approximate the data like that. So that's interpolation versus extrapolation. So let's go into MATLAB and actually utilize those. So first, interpolation. Let's say we have some data. And I'll just data is rand of one. So we got five points and I'll plot this. Here we go. There we are. So this is our data and we're trying to find, it'll be a different value of course, next time I run this, but let's just say this is at times one, two, three, four, and five. Let's just say length data is five so that we can make this generalized length data. So now I want to find the value of the data that we'd expect at two and a half, because I know exactly what it is at one, two, three, four, and five, but I want it at two and a half. Then the way we can do this is with interpolation and there's that built-in function in MATLAB interp1. If I pull up the docs for this. So here we've got interp1 with x, v, and x, q, and some additional optional inputs here like method and extrapolation. So as you can see by this, you might predict this is also how we will perform extrapolation. But let's just go with the most basic x, v, x, q. So it returns interpolated values of a 1D function. So it's just got some X and Y at specific points using linear interpolation. So just like here, using a line drawn between these points to approximate what it is in either the middle or at any point in between. So vector X, example points, V is the values. So the X is the X, the V is the Y. And the vector xq contains the coordinates of the query points or the points we're wondering about. So if I just wanted uh, my x's, so times data, and I wanted it at, what did we say, 2.5, and I could just plug in 2.5 as the sole point here. Oh, not plot. Uh, I want to do interp1. And then I can plot it. Here we are. So the data looks totally different now, but uh, the interp one will figure it out for us anyway. So 2.5, we could expect, uh, let's do this one more time and I'll do grid on. So 2.5, we could expect it's like 0.95. What is that like 0.965? Yeah, something like that, right? Between 0.957 and 0.97. So indeed, if we look at interp one, it, it just uses this line. So if you're drawing a line in between points with a plot, then you see exactly what interp one is doing because it's just approximating it like us visually, uh, we use these lines to approximate the data in between. It's what we expect. Uh, the interp one allows us to actually calculate out all of those points. So we could just plug in the 2.5 to interp one, and it'll give us halfway in between two and three. I could of course do 2.1. It doesn't have to be exactly halfway between. So 2.1, I'd expect like 0.4, seven, something like that. Yep. And indeed 0. 0.4712 is using this line to approximate this. So all this is doing is saying that I've got the equation of a line y equals mx plus b. And it's calculating that 
at the point before and the point after, and then plugging in that X. And there we go. We got the interpolated position out. And of course you could feed in new X's, so new times, and let's say 0 0.1 to length of data, but let's go in increments of 0 0.2. Uh, let's see, let's hear it. We're calling function. Oh, it's supposed to be new times. Run this. And here we are. Now we've got new times. And if I were to plot, uh, let's pull up a new figure and plot new times. And I didn't say this to variables, so just paste that in here. Then now, you can see this is my initial data. This is my second set of data. And all that's really happening here is it's calculating out these points at uh, starting at point one and every point two steps and calculating out the new length data. So it's basically the same curve. And in fact, in between all these lines, it will be the same. The only reason it doesn't have these points is because I didn't do this point here included in the new points. If I had included this point, it would look, uh, or each of these points, it would look exactly the same. As you can see, if I do this and then figure plot new times and this. And just as a reminder, let's do a subplot. Let's create a new figure here, subplot one, two, one, and subplot one, two, two. Here we are. And actually I'll do two, one, so that they're on top of each other. So here we are. Indeed, it looks exactly the same, except we've just got all the points in between, whereas this just stops at each individual point here. So that's how you can do interpolation. And of course, you could calculate it out yourself. If we go back to this, when I have a set of data with points, I can just look. And I could, for example, say for position equals one to length of data. So go from the start to the end, and then say if position is less than position cared about, and then I'll do and pose plus one is greater than pose care, then we know that it's in between these two points, and we could find the equation of the line, y equals mx plus b with those two points, and calculate out what that is. So that's an example how you could put that into practice because you may, for example, not be able to use MATLAB, but be able to use programming. So you don't have the built-in interp one, but you'd be able to create it yourself using for loop and an if statement. So very useful tools. And indeed that's something very similar to what they would have done when they were creating the interp one to start with. So let's go back and look at the interpolation one more time. So the function we had doc for interp one. So the next thing we can plug in is a method. So we have a couple different method options here. We have linear, nearest, next, previous, uh, so on, and spline. Uh, the most popular is linear, that's the default. Spline is a great option. Uh, nearest, you may be able to guess that just look here. If you're looking at that point, it'll just approximate it as this value. If you're looking at this point, it'll just approximate it as this value. So it just looks at whatever is the closest point, the shortest distance 
and it approximates the data with that. Uh, next is the future point, so the um, closest point going forward. Previous is the closest point going back, uh, so on. And spline is using a spline to connect all the points together to approximate it that way. So spline is a very popular one. If I just wanted to try that in this case, I could do spline right here and run this. So now you can see it's a bit different. It's not linearly interpolating. It's creating a spline between each of the points. So what it's doing is a little bit weird right at the end here. Doesn't make a very good approximation here, as you can see. But in between, it does curves that uh, pretty well match the data. So that's valuable. Often cubic, or uh, excuse me, often spline is a useful way, um, especially when you have lots of points and you want to check in like the midst of it and it's not going to be super pointed curves. Like if you're doing acceleration, you're not going to instantly accelerate. You're going to have some jolt, um, but it's going to be a curve. And so you can approximate that often with a spline. So that's interpolation. Um, now let's look at an example of use of this. So say I've got this temperature at two hours, two hours apart. You can approximate the temperature at any point using linear interpolation. Right here, we did exactly that. We looked at time three and five and used linear to approximate that. But what if we had the time at one in the morning and midnight, right? Those are probably both can be pretty cool. So let's say the temperatures look like, say it's in the thirties at both ends. Well, we know temperatures during the day spike up around noon, right? So Realistically, a linear interpolation here is not going to give you good information because right in the midst here, we're going to get something cold when it spiked up during the middle of the day. So this makes it important to one, recognize when you can do interpolation and it be valuable and two, to use data that's actually going to be helpful. So if you just had one extra point midday of data, then this interpolation will all of a sudden be significantly better. Uh, in fact, it would be much better to ignore one of these points and to at least have the temperature in the middle of the day because you want that greatest variance often when you're looking at interpolation. So that's an important thing to recognize as a limitation when you're trying to use this tool. And of note as well, with both interpolation and extrapolation, you cannot do anything if you have one point obviously, right? Because when we're trying to approximate, we're using relationships between points to approximate how it's going to change over time, right? We don't, we don't know exactly uh, where it is. We just have certain points. So if the true information was this, and we have all these, then it's not going to do perfect, but linearly interpolating between all these points will get us kind of close often to what the point is, but somewhere like here, it's not going to be as close, right? But with extrapolation, it's working very similar to interpolation, but use linear or something. You can use a spline, something like that to predict what it's going to be outside of the bounds of the data. So extrapolation is a much less accurate method than interpolation. Obviously, if you have data surrounding it, you have more information and it's easier to predict. Like if I have these points, um, it's much easier to predict in between than it is to try and guess because how do we know what this data is doing? Maybe it spikes up right here. Maybe it shoots down. We don't know. If we had this point, then it would be much easier to approximate. But where we don't, we have to extrapolate. And so typically, we'll just use the previous points and continue on the trend and uh, record that data. So I'd use like a linear relationship here, extrapolate it out to this point, and then figure out what that date is. 
So when I'm doing that in MATLAB, I can, if I want to extrapolate this old data, I can pull up the doc. And here I see extrapolations. So now, um, if I tried using just the normal interpolation, if I gave it a second set of new times, and let me say new times two, and I want this to be four extra points past the end of the length before. Well, if I try and do an interp one, I'll plot this again. Let's do this layered three high. So new times two times data, new times two and spline. If I just tried, let's just try and do this without giving it extrapolation. Oh, reason it's not working is because I put a two there. So if I don't give the extrap, it will, when I look up these numbers, it will just put not a number at all the points past the max. So the data ends where it, uh, where it was before. So in order to actually get that, I'd have to do extrap. And now when I run it, Let me also specify linear. So here we are. Now, it ends at uh, 9 instead of 5. And you can see it's just linearly going up from the endpoints and continuing forward. So that may or may not, if I try and put these at the same points between zero and five, zoom in a little bit more. So close to that, but with a greater Y span, then I can see I've only got the same data before, but now I've got past five because it's just linearly extrapolating it out. So I can switch this, I can try spline and it'll look quite different. So you can see now it's curved up just as it was before. So it keeps curving up, 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 up. And it's a lot uh, higher than it was before because it was more like this before. Now it's curving up. So that's uh, how you can, that's how you can do that. Um, and as you'll note, when you feed certain things in here, um, cubic, for example, does not support extrapolation. So you'd have to limit it to something like spline or your linear. So always pay attention when you get warnings in your code and check, okay, is something I did not working because you'd expect when you put in the extrap, you're probably wanting it to actually extrapolate, right? But if you say cubic, it's automatically going to ignore that extrap because it won't do it with cubic. So valuable thing to be paying attention to. So. Extrapolation is used to either predict where things will be or guess at where things were, right? Uh, as an example of this, you'd say if you've had the population of the Earth over the past few years, you'd extrapolate it from that to get the expected population in the next years, or you could guess at what it had been before. And you could use something like a spline with extrap in order to do that. All right, so now... We've talked about the interpolation and extrapolation. Now we mentioned fitting our data to a curve or some equation. So what we can do here is if I'm working with data, let's look at some data again. And let's say I've got these points. Sometimes it's a lot better to, rather than using interpolation or extrapolation to try and find the values in between. Sometimes you just want to figure out curve or something that's going to fit this data pretty well. So you want to approximate, maybe you want to see what sort of trend 
your data is having. So you can just check, maybe it's pretty linear. You just got all these points and you can approximate it with a line. Something like that is probably pretty close to getting um, accurate data. Often you'd have tons of points, so it would look something more like this. And something like that, you can see it sort of has a linear relationship. So we'd be able to approximate it with something like a line. But sometimes it isn't very linear. So we might have something like this, where it's curving down after having curved up. Well, that might be a set of data that's better modeled by something like this, a curve. So basically, what we're looking at now is we want to fit some polynomial to our data. So like this with just a line or this with a curve. And with polynomials, we just want to use a specific method to find where we're getting the least error in all of our things here. So what, what we can do and what MATLAB will be able to do for us, but we could figure out ourselves as well is we could go through with a bunch of lines and figure out what all of these errors are, right? Because these are our errors is the difference between our guest polynomial to fit the data and our actual points. And we're not going to be able to fit a perfect curve to this, right? Because it's not uh, to fit second order polynomial. With three points, you can perfectly define that. But more than that, unless it happens to be on exactly that curve at different points, you can't fit that degree of polynomial to that set of data. So with that, where you've got noisy data, you have your errors. And basically with MATLAB, we can use a tool called polyfit. And this will just try and find a polynomial uh, that will tell it, be it a line or a second, third, fourth degree polynomial, whatever we specify, in order to get the lowest error here. But let's look at polyfit in action in MATLAB. So fitting polynomial to data. So let's say we have random data again. Data is random numbers and a hundred of them. Or let's let's just do five again for now. And times we'll just say one to length of data again. Okay, so we've done interpolation and extrapolation on this, but let's do a polyfit. So polyfit. And if I pull up the documentation, polyfit. Polyfit takes in an X, a Y, and an N. X and Y are just like in the interp, the X and V. But the N turns the uh, coefficients for a polynomial P of X with degree N. So N is the degree of polynomial we've got here. So. If we wanted a line, for example, how would we do that? So if we want to polyfit times data, and if I just feed in a one, for example, what will that give us? It will give us two points, and this will be the equation of a line. Because if I plot, uh, let's do the same thing as before. I do plot times data on a subplot, two, one, one, and then another subplot, two, one, two, with the times, and then I'll do times dot multiply with polynomial. And let's try polynomial of one plus polynomial of two. Let's see what 
that looks like. So that sort of matches our data, and we could check in the documentation, okay, of x, y, n, it returns a polynomial p of x for the data in y. The coefficients p are in descending powers, and like the p is n plus 1. So it's in descending powers, so it'll give the one that is multiplied by t first. All right, because if we tried to do this instead, if we thought it was in ascending order, then you can see that doesn't quite match what our data, we, we would expect something like a line like this, right? To get fairly close to it, but we get a line completely off. So indeed it goes in descending order here. And you can see that's our approximate or approximated line. And in this case, it's probably going to be easier to visualize with a overlay. So we'll just do a hold on and we'll make this one dashed. And you can see it, kind of what that's doing. It's making a line uh, interpolating between each of these points. And realistically, when you do a line, I did each of the points plugged into this, but you'd really no, only need the endpoints because it's just a line, right? But uh, let's say we had a higher degree polynomial on it. I want it to be second order. Well, we can see here, this is not even close. The reason for that is of course, because now we've got times squared multiplied by polynomial two plus the times. Okay, and this is pretty far off, but let's check. Oh, that's because this is one, this is two, and this is three, of course. So now we're getting a lot better than before. We'll run this a few times. Often using just random numbers, this isn't gonna fit super well. But let's say we had uh, 1, 3, 7, 15, and 25. Now we can see that's fairly well fitting a, a second order polynomial, the data is. So now we've got a pretty good curve here uh, with this polynomial data matching or the calculations from the polynomial matching our data quite well. So that's what happens when you get data that super well works for a specific polynomial. And uh, in order to make this simpler, we've got our polyfit, but we can use polyval, which will save us a bunch of time. And instead of having to calculate it out ourselves, because all we're doing here, right, is we're saying polyfit, and polyfit will return A, B, C, etc. And let's say just for the example of we get three outputs, A, B, and C. So this would be polyfit X, Y, 2 for A, B, and C. You get A times X squared plus B times X plus C, of course, and you could go with whatever degree here. But to make this simpler, you can use the function polyval. And this will just take as inputs the polynomial output, so the coefficients from polyfit. So my a, b, c, for example. And check the documentation here. Let's just pull up the help polyval. Well, if I go up here to the top, polyval of px turns the value of a polynomial p, so that'll be the coefficients indeed, and then our x as the second here. So instead of having to write this out and change it every time we change the polynomial, we could just use polyval of polynomial and times and that would 
work perfectly. And now I could change it to a one here and it would work just fine. So that's using polyfit to fit some data, right? Now let's look at an example. This is something that would be very common in like industry. You have something that's basically a exponential. And so you have times is one to 100. Uh, data is the XP of times, but your data has some noise. So I'm going to say data equals data plus rand of one length of data. Just put some data in there and we'll increase the magnitude. Let's make the randomness the magnitude of 10. Let's say we'll look at how that looks real quick and then see if we like that times data. Okay, uh, that looks like it's going a little too far for me. So let's just go 1.110 and see. And it looks like there's not a ton of noise. So let's increase this. You can start seeing some waves in the data there. Let's get five times that. Now you can see a bit of noise. But let's just make it a lot, right? So this is what you're going to see more realistically in real data, right? Because you're getting noise either uh, like friction. Things are coming into your physics model that uh, should basically perfectly match um, some equations. So something like 1 half AT squared plus VT plus P naught for the acceleration of an object falling through the air at some initial velocity and position. But we've got a ton of noise from friction, from air resistance, from just noise within the actual electronics, not measuring it properly. So we got tons of noise here, but you can still see the trend of it's exponentially increasing here. But let's say we don't know exactly that it's an exponential relationship. Well, we may want to try and match this with the polynomial. So we can do the exact same thing as we did here and fit a polynomial to it. And then we can sort of see what trend our data is having. And we can see, for example, we could look at the error with certain polynomials and then kind of figure out uh, experimentally just using MATLAB or some other programming tool. OK, this is my data, well, it's pretty well fit by a uh, second order curve or something like that. So let's continue on with the same thing as before. We got my polynomial and right here. So as you can see, this is a pretty high error, right? This isn't very well matching our data, but nothing would super match our data great because it's a uh, very noisy, but a second order. Let's see, does that match our data a lot better? And indeed it does because it can compensate. It's not just a linear relationship here. Uh, so a second order, a parabola like this could better model our data and a third could do it even better in fact. But uh, one word of warning, if you increase this, a lot, then it's actually not very useful. And the reason is at uh, the endpoints or very far past, you can see this pretty well matches our data. I could move this up to like ridiculously high and we start to see a problem. So here the dashed is our polynomial and you can see Right now, it's it's not very accurately representing our data. And that's because super high order polynomials and even you don't have to go up to 50. Once you start getting to realistically like nine, um, it's not great. But you can see with this that 
that this polynomial is not well able to fit the data. And it's just because with that many, with 50 coefficients, you're not going to get good, uh, good minimization of error with really any curve, uh, but especially this short of length of one. So you do not want to, to be aiming for that. And the reason if we look at this again, what it starts to do with high order polynomials is if you just had like three points, what it'll start to do is it'll do like this, where it successfully hits each and every point, or it gets very close, but it's got all this waviness in it. So it's not very successfully, like it could be, if I can draw here, it could be shooting way up right here. And that's not at all what our data is doing. So typically you want to minimize and often that means you're doing something like third order. Oh, let me show you the, the curve there. You want to go to the third because unlike the 50, it's not having those problems of it's super overshooting at this point and then undershooting or overshooting. It's, it's pretty low polynomial, so it's not going to run into those problems. So that's a very important thing to recognize when you're trying to do a polynomial fit to some data. But, uh, but yeah, that's an example where real data, you might experience something like this. It's really something like an exponential, but you've got just some noise and you can't, you can't see exactly that it fits an exponential. So you'd fit some polynomial to it. All right. So that's interpolation, extrapolation and polynomial fit and polyval. All right. So why do you use what, and when would you use it? So let's look at our main thing that we've been talking about. Let's say you have a bunch of data. And you want to figure out what the expected data is at various points. So you got this data. And so if we've got this data, we could, uh, in order to guess the points, we could use interpolation. If it's within the midst of the points, if it's got data on either side, we could interpolate on the boundaries here. If it's past those far reaches, then we could extrapolate. And we could also do a polyfit to approximate this data with some curve, right? Do something like this. And with the polyfit, we could then do function of the new data and uh, find the approximate at this point, for example. Right? But uh, why would you do which? Well, if data storage is not a concern, then you'll probably have more information by keeping all of your data and using it to interpolate. Because for example, if you had data like this, then Approximating it with some curve like this, you get you pretty close, but let's say these are your points. Well, right here, you'll probably, if this isn't just noise and it's accurate measurements, then you'll probably have better chance just approximating it with a interpolation between these points, right? That'll get you closer to your true, if it's, it's temperatures, then you're most likely to find the true temperature uh, using a linear interpolation, then trying to approximate it down here, which isn't even between these points, right? So for these two points, you would have more accuracy by interpolating between them than by using the polynomial. The only real case when you would want to use a polynomial is a specific case where you know what the data will be looking like and it's really better to use a polynomial to fit it and it'll clean up some noise. 
So for example, if this is like some acceleration data and you know it's super noisy, then trying to fit the data may get you actually more accurate because you're removing some of the noise. If this were more noisy, then the polynomial could help. But um, another advantage of it is with data. Instead of having to store a ton of points like this, you'll only have to store the coefficients, right? That is an advantage. So instead of needing thousands of points stored or analyzed, it's just a very simple equation. You have a couple of numbers. And it makes it very easy to try and do differentiation, to uh, model future data. Like if you, if you know the coefficients of this data, then maybe you know that uh, over time you collect lots of data and you construct equations modeling all those and you notice that certain factors affect the equation in a certain way. So the location, for example, that you put your temperature sensor, that could make, it could make one coefficient twice what it would be if it weren't that change, right? So that's an advantage. It allows you to use that information for the future and predict what data is going to be. Numerical data is very difficult to predict like that. And so why would you pick one or the other? Well, as we've been saying, the answer typically lies in the type of data you've got. Maybe you're in an industry where the type of data for that machine environment or other condition driving the output of the data, it's known to be well fit by a specific curve and you just need to find the co coefficients for this specific set of data. It's a lot easier to fit those coefficients or whatever parameters defining your equations than it is to, st to store years worth of data. If that's not the case, then typically you'll just use numerical methods like interpolation and extrapolation. And then you'll keep storing the data and then you can use various methods such as if I have a set of data like this, then I can probably extract these points right here and just keep points like this. And with just including those, I'll be able to get still quite a good, maybe a linear method of interpolation and accurately represent the data. So you can often use methods like this to keep really the only the important sets of points. So for example, at our temperature example earlier, you might record like beginning of the day, middle of the day and end and maybe two other points. And really, at that point, you are successfully encompassing the main things you care about. Because it may be like a sinusoidal set of data, so it's not easy to store in a curve or something like that. But you can easily house in relatively few points the temperatures over time. So that is an option as well. One main way of doing this is either checking on either side of this point. If you remove this point and do a linear interpolation, how much error would th this point versus the approximation with the linear interpolation give you? So that's one method and take out the points where it doesn't introduce a ton of error. Another method is if it has a high second derivative or a third derivative, then it's telling you that there's a huge amount of change in this. The velocity change is significant. And so you may want to include that point. So those are typically some of the main ways that you can uh, reduce excess points and simplify your data. And there are tons of other options uh, of interpreting data and storing it. So. One option is you may have heard of neural networks, which are a big thing right now uh, in computer science. And neural networks just take in a certain number of inputs and then feed them in to some computations to get out a certain output. So very basic neural network would like work something like this. It's got like your nodes and then you add them here, add them here, add them maybe subtract them here, add them, subtract them, and then multiply them by one half, 
and then you know an output one here is low, an output two here is high, whatever it may be. But you can take some inputs and get an output. And that's another way of handling data is using layers of computation here. So there are tons of options out there, but, uh, and we're finding even more day, day by day, but it's good to keep in mind. This is the sort of foundations of dealing with data, but data science is a huge field and it's continuously changing. If you ever need, if your boss ever asks you to, uh, to take some set of data and approximate, like, is this well fit by linear? Now you know how to do that, how to fit it to a curve, things like that. So you can get good results and, uh, and have it be repeatable and easy and automated. So thanks. Hopefully you learned a lot and it was interesting.